Hello! And um, welcome to Nordic Game 2019. Uh, to be honest, I uh, was planning to do a kind of a speech, but then I started doing other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and then it became Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, and here we are. But I did, actually, I did, I, I did a start, and I wanted to do it right now. Okay, so um, welcome to Naughty Game 2019. My name is Jacob uh, Rees. I'm the program director. And um, this is the 16th edition of the conference. Yeah, right? Sweet 16. That is the year when an annoying child becomes an even more annoying child. So I'm quite happy Naughty Game is a conference and not a child. Not least because I would then have three kids now with three different moms and one of the moms would be called Eric Robertson. <laughs> okay, that was as far I got in my speech. Okay, but actually there's a, a little bit of truth to the uh, analogy here because um, I don't know, how many of you have been to Naughty Game before? Woohoo! Nice to see you again! And you've noticed that uh, the child that we call Naughty Game have, has changed a little bit for this year, right? You know, there's a new entrance. Have you noticed that? Yeah, <laughs> obviously. Uh, and, and I know it's kind of confusing, but also because we've chosen to call the auditoriums the same names, but then turn them around and shift it just to make it even more confusing. Also, so that you actually use this print program that we have spent hours on producing, right? Um, so, I just wanna highlight a bit of what is in store for the next three days. We have 140 speakers ready for you. I think, uh, from my perspective, this is one of the strongest programs I've ever been part of producing. Um, there's a lot of great content in there, and it will start uh, as soon as I'm done, because I'm not part of that. Um, but I will really, really um, say that you should go to as many lectures as you can, besides doing all the other stuff. And all the other stuff is, of course, business. I know a lot of you is, are here to do business. Actually, not you, because then you would be at the Meet to Match already, and you wouldn't be sitting here, right? But... Um, I, I know they have already broken all records. It's something like, I don't know, 3,000 something meetings that are gonna be held du during these uh, three days and it's, uh, it's incredible. Um, so that part is also really good. The publisher market is going on right now where developers meeting publishers. And um, one thing that is another kind of uh, bastard child that I have made is the Nordic Game Discovery Contest. I don't know if you've noticed, but we have 17 games on display in the expo area uh, from all, all parts of the world, even from South Africa. They have all been through qualification rounds of our pitching competition, and uh, now they're here, and their games are on display. And the thing that are their task for the next two days is to convince you to vote for them so that four of the best of them goes on to the final on Friday where they will battle here on stage, which I will also urge you to come and see because it's highly entertaining seeing people getting roasted and I am the host and it will be so much fun. And oh, also the judges, among the judges will be Warren Spector, he will be sitting there and roast people and I, I don't know, I'm gonna be there, I hope you will too. Then, another new thing is, I mean, we always do a lot of social events, and we always did our gala dinner. This year, we've tried something completely new, and I'm really looking forward to it. We call it the Nordic Game Dinner Experience, um, because it's not a gala dinner anymore, and it's not a sit-down where you get forced to sit and talk to annoying people all night. 
Um, you can actually walk around and it's not taking place here either. So we have buses driving you to uh, the venue called Moriscan, but all the info obviously is here or uh, in our website. So you can read more about it. I hope that you have registered for the dinner. If, if not, it's too late, I guess. But then you can always join the party afterwards, which will be at the same venue there. So please do that because there I have the most insane project going on with a metal band with musicians from all over the world playing to a game that will be played live by an influencer and streamed while the band is playing music live and you as audience can be there to cheer. I don't know, I've never seen anything like that, so I hope that it will be a success and not crash. So, and then everything culminates obviously on Friday with the Discovery Day, uh, where we have even more games on display. We end up here with the contest finals, and after that, this, the wrap up with um, you know, a lot of ceremonial stuff where you can win tickets for next year, and I think that we will announce the dates for next year even. So please, 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 if you have uh, the health and the endurance, please stay all through the, the next three days until Friday at, I think, 8 o'clock in the evening where we finally lie down and die. And then I'm actually done, I think. I welcome you all. Thank you so much for coming. I'm not going to say thank you to all these people that are helping me and Eric by making this conference yet. We'll do that on Friday after we've seen how they performed. <laughs> um, um, but the only thing I have left to say is now you're in for a treat. The opening keynote is uh, from a very, very talented woman, Anastasia Op Opera. I was always, almost saying Opera, not, not, no, not the browser, not the browser. Um, from a uh, new Swedish studio, Embark. I don't know if you've heard about them, but I have, and I uh, expect great things from them. So with no further ado, please welcome Anastasia. Please come up on stage. Thank you so much, and see you around. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Okay, let's start. So, I don't know about you, but I like spending time on making the first slide of my presentation. I end up tweaking it endlessly until it's just right. But finding the style I'd like to commit to, that takes time. And usually I find myself exploring less creative options than I would like to. So I decided that this time I'll make a few, but very different. So I started with this one. I mean, it was okay. I was like 100% sold. But I like the sketchiness of it. So I tried another one. Actually, maybe with more fuzzy letters. Yeah, more like this. Or maybe with more color. Or more like Van Gogh Starry Night. Or maybe an actual Starry Night. But it kind of looks sleepy, maybe more powerful with fire and aggression. <laughs> or on the contrary, a chilled winter forest. But yeah, as you probably have guessed by now, each image is generated. And image, each image you see took only 20 seconds to make, with texture synthesis and remixing from a single example. So I'm Anastasia Parra, and I'm a procedural artist at Embark Studios, and I'm very excited to be presenting for you today. So in total, I generated about 3,000 intro slides. By having a library of roughly 150 images as examples, and I also made six guides, which were to dictate composition and contrast. And then I just let the texture synthesis run while I was doing something else. And then I came back and just cherry-picked what I liked. And this ability to explore so many ideas and combinations quickly, and the thrill of finding combinations that would work, and just seeing what happens and where it can take me creatively, that was a lot of fun. It was like a visual brainstorm on steroids. And the main principle of the algorithm is not very complicated. Every pixel simply asks, if these are my neighbors, what is my color? And the answer to that question is the example image we provide. So the example image itself is a program that every pixel follows. 
But hey, does it mean we are programming by giving an example? And the answer is yes, and I think that is why example-based synthesis is so interesting. Oh yeah, you can make pretty trippy GIFs <laughs> by generating a couple of variations. At Embark, we believe that it should be as easy to create as it is to play, which requires us to rethink the way we create today. And I believe one way to approach the vision of accessible creation is by enabling to effortlessly sculpt and navigate creative possibility space. So what do I even mean with sculpting possibility space? Tools define our workflows. That is why one of my main fascinations with proceduralism comes from the power to define what I artistically want via a set of rules. So I basically encode my own artistic process and decision making into an algorithm. And that algorithm in turn outputs a space of generated outcomes that are following the rules I described. And I can sculpt that space by manipulating the algorithm. And as a mechanism for navigation through the space, I can add sliders or other parameters that are treated as inputs to my carefully designed functions. But making tools requires a lot of knowledge that is often orthogonal to content creator skills. And it also requires to disrupt the creative flow and step into translate what you want so the program understands mindset. And it is also time consuming. But imagine if we could define a space of possibilities by providing examples of what we want and have a program extract relevant rules from these examples. Then we can immediately jump into the exploration of the generative space without needing to manually craft the points we're exploring or the algorithm itself, thus always staying within the creative iteration loop. And in the end, we will probably converge in a point we are satisfied with. And this point, in this malleable by example space can be reused as an example for the next space we or maybe someone else designs. And because of the example based nature, these spaces have a format intuitive to both read and write, meaning that content creators will be able to create their own tools by doing what they already do best, making awesome stuff. And of course, getting to that workflow is a long journey. And even though we have many ideas on how to get there, we don't have all the answers. And it is most likely not the answer, but a piece of an overall puzzle. And we are at the very beginning of our exploration, where texture synthesis, the topic of this talk, is just a small step towards a bigger vision, where ultimately we are interested in creation of full 3D interactive experiences. OK, so now that you have a bit of wise, Let's talk about technical house. So how does texture synthesis work? And also a brief and totally incomplete history of non-parametric texture synthesis. So when working with procedural systems, I often design a top-down hierarchical approach where I determine a strict sequence of generator chains, which operate in a dependency isolation from one another. So let's say we want to make a procedural house, then we would start with generating a silhouette, and that silhouette would issue commands for other generators to be placed. But before passing it to doors, windows, and other modules, it would determine locations and handle all dependencies, so the next generators will receive information that is unaffected by other generators' outcomes. So when making the door knobs and wooden planks, we can be quite sure that it would not suddenly mess up the chimney. And that allows us to break down a complex task into smaller manageable chunks, which is amazing if we are only interested in top-down questions, such as, if this is my silhouette, um, where are the windows? However, if we ask a reverse question, if the windows are here, what is the house? The generator would not be able to answer. But what would happen if, instead of having a hierarchy of commands, we would have a self-organizing system of simple elements where each contributes to a collective emergent decision. And to make the explanation a bit more approachable, <laughs> I present you your hosts today. Meet the color blobs of Pixeltown. <laughs> they are extremely social beings who love to hang out with other color blobs by coordinating their colors together. And they are looking for a new home, and so happens that we are about to synthesize a whole bunch of new pixels for a new image. So let's imagine that the image we want to make or to generate is in fact a perfectly grid-like pixel town, where every pixel cell is a house waiting for a color blob occupant. However, we have a specific visual goal in mind. We want to generate something that looks like an example image. So how do we communicate that to the color blobs when they start moving in? 
Well, we provide them with an example image itself, but deconstruct it into neighborhood patterns and the corresponding pixel color that should be placed if a specific pattern is encountered. So you can think of it as an instruction manual that tells each color blob what color they should be if the neighbors are in particular color combination. So in these examples, if my colors are light green, I would also be light green. And if my colors are dark green, I'll also become dark green. And we have a lot of these kind of rules, basically as many as we can break the image into. And here is just a visualization of deconstructing an image into three by three neighborhood patterns. And as you can see, this image is just 50 by 50, but in a, in a, in a bit, so we will end up actually with quite a few patterns in our manual. <laughs> and you can imagine if the picture is bigger, we get much more patterns, and this is just three by three patterns. So how do pixels or color blobs even use all these patterns? So let's investigate a concrete example. So here's Bob. Bob is a color blob, and he plans to move into the pixel town. But before he can do that, he needs to know what color complements best to his existing neighbors. So he goes around his neighbors and records everyone he saw, and in what order. And if no one moved in, he also checks that. So what Bob does is a construction of his neighborhood color pattern. Then Bob checks the manual, and he goes through the list of all possible patterns. And let's remove the neighbors that are not present, so we can compare easier. And as you can see, it might so happen that there is no exact match. But that doesn't stop Bob as he decides, oh well, I will try to follow the manual as best as I can. So Bob chooses the closest matching color pattern to the pattern of his neighbors. And sure, the purple is a little bit off, it's more like brown here, but hey, otherwise it's a pretty good guess. So Bob takes the color associated with that pattern as his final choice. And he moves into the pixel town, and everyone's happy. And then Mary moves in, and she does exactly the same. And she will partially base her choice on Bob's color choice, because now he is her neighbor, and she knows she can trust him, since he followed exactly the same menu. And so this process is repeated until the whole town is full. And through this repeated local behavior, the resulting generated image emerges to be perceptually similar to the example image. And I say emerge because individual pixels are never actually aware of the full picture they are part of and have no knowledge of the example image as a whole, but just a disjoint collection of pattern rules. And this technique was first proposed in 1981 by Garber, but discarded due to computational tractability at the time and then proposed again independently 18 years later by Efforts and Lung in 99, and became an origin of a whole subfield of texture synthesis called non-parametric texture synthesis. And it was also my first implementation in the texture synthesis journey. However, the proposed method was not perfect. First of all, it was very slow. For an example image of just 100 by 100, it is 10,000 pattern examples we have to, that have to be checked by every pixel we synthesize. So if we're generating an image of 100 by 100 with a pattern of, let's say, 12 neighbors, it is 1.2 billion queries in total. Secondly, if a pixel doesn't have a good matching pattern to follow, it is still forced to make a decision what color it should be, no matter how a bad decision turns out. But that in turn means that the following pixels will also be more likely to make a poor decision, as they will be influenced by the previous decisions. Thus, it creates a chain reaction of poorly chosen pixels, resulting in garbage growing. And as you can see in the example on the right, we have places where details are completely lost and become smudged on certain mass. So one of the solutions to the first problem, <laughs> the problem of slowness, was tree search for closest matching pattern. And it was first proposed in fast texture synthesis using tree structured vector quantization. However, the technique has a requirement for all the search queries to adhere to the same format. Thus, you could no longer have an arbitrary pattern of neighbors. It had to be fixed across all pixels. So a scanline order became a natural solution. Another contribution from this paper, which was used before in texture synthesis, but now with non-parametric flavor, was multi-resolution synthesis, where you decompose the example Im image into an image pyramid which is the same image, but at multiple resolution scales. And we generate starting from the lowest resolution all the way to the highest. 
And the intuition behind this is that by having some information from the previous level, that sort of gives you a general idea of a bigger picture around you in the current resolution level. And quite a curious property of this algorithm is that you start generating from noise, which is refined to look more and more plausible through multiple resolution levels as more and more details are being synthesized. Or if you want to add AI vibe to this, you can say that the details are being imagined from the noise by the algorithm. But no, it's just a plain best fit search. And here's just a small example that no matter what image we start with as our lowest level of pyramid, actually this one's, this one's an example, we will end up with something that resembles the original example image, because those are the only patterns that are available for the algorithm to operate on. And I guess one can <laughs> treat this as a sort of funky style transfer with image pyramids. Coming back to the garbage growing problem, a series of patch-based techniques were proposed, as it was noticed that very few pixels actually had multiple choices of what they can be, and often are completely determined by what has been generated around them. Thus, the logic is, why waste compute power on synthesizing individual pixels when we're inevitably copying bigger patches? So let's just shortcut to copying bigger patches and then hide the seams between those. So kind of like a mosaic or a jigsaw puzzle. And then there was another very interesting technique proposed in synthesizing natural textures that touched on both the speed of the search as well as patch-based synthesis. So what we do is we ask each of our neighbors where did they come from in the original example image and neighbors from the generated image. And based on that, we determine uh, what, like, what our color can be. So you can think of it as every neighbor makes a suggestion of what next pixel color should be. And then we also add a couple of random candidates from the example, just in case all of our neighbors had terrible ideas. And the result is not just massively sped up search, since we greatly reduce the number of candidates, thus the size of our manual, but also since in many cases we are going along with neighbor's suggestions, we are effectively copying patches, but in a very irregular shape, avoiding obvious seams between pieces, like here. But since there are only dozens of patterns to pick from, we are no longer dependent on a tree structure search to do it fast. Thus, we do not really care for a scanline order anymore. In fact, the resolution order can be completely arbitrary. And in his dissertation, Image Texture Tools, Paul Harrison proposed, let's just do it at random. And it is very curious because it is implicitly multi-scale. So why is that? So let's imagine that this is an image being generated and pink purple cells are resolved pixels and orange is a pixel being resolved now. And let's say we are checking just for three closest resolved neighbors as our neighborhood pattern. So in the case of iteration 20, since not so many pixels have been resolved yet, we have a big search radius, meaning we capture more global, further away information, but it is also rather sparse, opposed to iteration 200 where our three ne nearest neighbors are much closer to us, resulting in a tighter search radius where we only capture immediate, but it is also more frequent information. And as more and more pixels get resolved, our search radius shrinks. So kind of naturally, we go from big sparse search to a smaller local one. And the second idea introduced with image texture tools was, okay, let's say our initial color guess was far from ideal. We didn't know much at the time, and we based our color on very few faraway pixels. And now we are not fitting in with the new color pixels that have been generated around us. And that is fine, because we can choose again, and again, and again, as many, time as, what you, what, as, you, <laughs> as many times as you perform what is called backtracking. So here's a comparison of generating this gradient image on the right with and without backtracking. And as you can see, without backtracking, we have to stick with our initial choices, no, but no matter how bad they are. And our uncertainty, which is basically the error of the chosen pixels, it stays unchanged. Opposed to the backtracking version, where we are able to reduce the error by choosing again, based on the new information around us. And this is an example of a generated image. And we can get a couple of nice visualizations, such as places of uncertainty, which are usually located where the copied patches meet, 
in this copied patches visualization. And here is the same color. It means that the whole patch of the same color has been just straight copied from the example. And that also gives a nice intuition into what is happening, which you can think of as mixing the image up and gluing the patches together as best as possible. And this is how the resolution process looks like in action. And at this point, it was already my fourth Python prototype of texture synthesis. And it was a version that decided to take further, as both its implicit multi-scale neighbor search, as well as ability to correct mistakes, looked quite promising. And Tomasz Stachowiak and myself had a couple of contributions that we added along the way. First of all, we noticed that because of the algorithm's stochastic nature, during early stages of resolution, the sparse neighbor information can be misleading. So let's say that this is the image we have as example, and we just generated these three brown pixels so far. Now, if we want to resolve this pixel in the red cell, we have uh, quite a bit of ambiguity whether it is a house, so it would be brown, or it's a tree, green. And if we look at the candidate patterns, <laughs> they are exactly the same for both tree and the house from these kernels. So what do we do in this case? And why so happen that we will just have a patch of the house and the tree trying to fight with each other who actually has the right to be in the image, resulting in a very obvious seam as it will just try to blend between them. And our observation was that in the beginning, you don't really care for specific pixel colors. You care more about the global distribution of stuff in the image making sense. And that is why we start with generating a blurry version of the image where a lot of pixel values are averaged out with their neighbors, thus sort of encoding information about the surroundings. And then we progressively switch to a sharper version of the image as we have more and more resolved pixels. And this way, for example, in this house and tree case, we avoid the ambiguity, as we can clearly see that tree is more brownish green and house is more brownish red. And here is an example of the resolution stages of the algorithm. And we can also control how many of those levels we want to go through and how much percent of total image is resolved at each stage. And when comparing to vanilla version, we noticed much better remixing, as the vanilla version hangs on to details already at the early stages, which results in it trying to stitch multiple islands together only at the later stages, and it creates more obvious seams. Whereas the multi-resolution forces us to consider more global distribution from early on, and we also got much more interesting style transfer results, as it preserves more original style features, such as this kind of flowers. But after style transfer testing, we noticed that the increased neighbor count yielded worse results in staying within the range of 20. And we hypothesized that it might be due to all neighbors, no matter how close or far they are, they were weighted equally. So that means that once you have a lot of neighbors, there are more further, one, further away ones than the close ones, and then skews the generation to satisfy the majority, which are the furthest ones, thus sacrificing the immediate neighbors in favor of dominant distant ones. But the solution was rather simple, actually even used in the original non-parametric texture synthesis paper, of weighing each neighbor based on just how far away it is from the pixel we're resolving. And as you can see, especially with style transfer, we drastically reduce the garbage growing. So here, in these cases, we have a lot of just same color because it wasn't sure what to do, and now we have a much better pattern. So last but not least, here is a table Woo comparing all the neighbor par non-parametric implementations I did and times it takes for various image sizes. I tried to keep the settings as similar as possible to have a fair comparison, and the settings between the last two are the same. And being evangelized by my colleagues, I re-implemented the random order algorithm in Rust programming language, which out of the box actually was about 20 times faster than Python. And then together with Tom, just over the weekend, we did a bunch of micro-optimizations, such as using R star tree for nearest neighbor search when constructing the neighborhood pattern. And Tom also added CPU multithreading. And because the algorithm is stochastic and pixel resolution does not strictly depend on what has been synthesized immediately before, and even if it does, a lot of errors will be corrected in the backtracking, it was pretty straightforward to multithread. So overall, it was a pretty massive speed up from my first implementation. And now with our latest version, we get 500 by 500 image in just two and a half seconds and 1000 by 1000 in under 10. And that is if you are generating the whole image from scratch, because you can also just generate a part of an image and it is going to be faster because it mostly depends just on the number of pixels that you want to resolve. And just to summarize this section of the presentation, I would like to take a moment to marvel at how you're really always building on the shoulder of giants. And the work that has been done before inspires and enables to do something new. 
And it's, this is just a small, humble addition to the chain of really awesome ideas. But now, let's talk about how texture synthesis can be used. And I like to think of use cases as artifacts of an archaeological expedition, where we have the ultimate goal, but we also discover a bunch of interesting stuff along the way that we can use already today. So, first and most obvious, <laughs> we can generate new similar-looking images from an example image. And we even have a pseudo-terministic seed, and it is pseudo because of multi-threading, as we cannot guarantee which thread picks up which pixel. But generally, you almost don't see the difference between the outcomes. So I guess in practice, you can probably use this feature as find 10 differences puzzle generator, but super hard code mode. We can also guide the generation by providing a mapping in a form of guide maps, which are this abstract kind of low effort images, either black and white or RGB. And you can map a certain part of the image to be circular or any other shape, like in the example on the left, where I took the spherofluid and I asked it to go from this shape to this shape. And as you can see, we also can get different variations. Or you can do a more involved semantic guidance, like here, where semantically I marked that green is ivy and blue is the wall and red is window, and then I just asked for a different kind of shape of ivy and just two windows, and it generated that. And it is, I think, is really quite convenient and interesting because you're manipulating from a higher abstraction level than the image content itself. And this kind of guidance can also be generated automatically to produce a style transfer type of effect. So what we are basically doing is we generate guide maps as luminance of your target and example maps. So then we do some histogram matching, apply some Gaussian blur, and use the same process as in the previous slide. And if you're like me and Tom, you can sync the whole weekend generating Tom's faces, <laughs> because it's that addicting. But apart from that, we were actually quite impressed with the algorithm's ability to preserve style features and remap um, the image to still look like a face. And of course, you can also control how much style versus content you would like. So you can go from one, which means you want to fully preserve the original content, or you can go, or you can lower it, which in the context of the algorithm just means how much it weighs the cost between style and content when choosing best candidates. And this is controlled by the alpha parameter, and it, but basically it is also actually adaptive, which means the more pixels get resolved, the smaller it gets until we don't care for it at all, meaning we just put it to zero, and that is done to not penalize smaller detail creation during the later stages. But moving on, we can also do tiling textures. We can either synthesize one from scratch, like in the example on the left, or we can edit the original non-tiling image and make it tile, like on the example on the right. And the most exciting feature is the variation of tiling you get Kind of like in this example, in the place of the seam, we can either just get some dark vegetation or an actual flower, or hit the generate button again and get something new. We can also fill in missing information. And again, we get a bunch of variations pretty much for free. And even when a lot of information is missing, like in this bark example, it is still able to possibly restore the image just from the existing data, which is not the red pixels, the other ones. And it is not limited to the generation from a single image. We can have multiple examples, which can be used to mix multiple images together. So the visualization on the right kind of <laughs> gives you a hint from the map ID, where each color indicates from which image the patches were taken. But let me show you more explicitly what came from where. So this part came from there, and this part came from there, and I like how I just remix those two together. And this part came from here. So yeah, it's pretty exciting to see it. I was able to do that pretty nicely. And we can also start layering all of those verbs we just went through. So how about multi-example guided generation? <laughs> Here, I'm generating 30 new Russian Nalichnik windows from only five examples and corresponding guide maps. And then I ask to basically transform those images and mix them in such a way that I base my target guide map. And to help generation a little bit, I also include spatial information in the form of a gradient in the red channel in the guide maps. As you can see, the red goes from 1 to 0. 
and I also generate only half of the image and mirror it in the end. But this was quite a curious, neat workflow for exploring variations out of very small data sets and no training required. And why be limited only to 2D? We can also do 3D if we can represent it as texture data, such as displacement maps. Then just from a single rock example, we can generate more using the same texture synthesis code. And in order to correlate displacement data with colored data, we set it up as a hierarchical generation where we first generate displacement guided by user-created guide maps, and then we generate color guided by the displacement maps. Therefore, the color is aware of the shape of the rock, so we naturally get dirt in the creases, grass in the flatter areas, and so on. And those dependencies are automatically captured for us. And imagine if we got a bigger library of rock examples, then we could remix maybe multiple rocks together. Our artists have used texture synthesis for some of their terrain workflows, where they start with large-scale terrain laser scan data, but it comes with a lot of undesired elements, such as shadows, roads, and trees. And texture synthesis, together with Photoshop's content aware fill, can be used to clean that up. And content fill is good on its own, like average color filament, but as Pontus Ruman, our environment artist, points out, texture synthesis can provide high quality details that you can't generate otherwise, and they fit together with the image seamlessly. And then Pontus had a really cool idea when uh, we can use the difference between before and after to extract actual placement masks for in game assets such as trees and bushes. So here is just an example of before and after. And this is, by the way, a 16K image. So it took a while, <laughs> ranging between 10 to 15 minutes to generate. So it's not really a real-time workflow, but still vastly faster than doing manually. And we can have a nice coffee break while it does the work for us. And here is just a small snippet of the internal show and tell. What you're looking at is our first environment test. The purpose of this test was to see how far we could push the size and scale of our worlds with a small team using smart techniques and tools. This is a 256 square kilometer terrain with another 3000 square kilometer backdrop to add to the sense of scale. To build it, we used laser scan terrain data and satellite imagery. With our own in-house tech, we filter out unwanted data from the ground surface satellite image, like bushes and trees. We then used our internal texture synthesis tool to procedurally generate replacement data and add a real 3D assets to populate the world. Combined with a procedurally generated snow and weather system, the result is an environment that feels lifelike and dynamic, filled with naturally placed rocks, grass, bushes and roots. And just a note, Pontus asked me to point, Pontus asked me to point out, uh, he said texture synthesis is used for generating placements. What he actually meant is generating placement mask because of the, we just use it as an image of difference before and after. And by the way, if you, if you want to see more of the crazy awesome work our artists are doing, do check out the Medium blog posts where we showcase our first environment test and also talk about our photogrammetry workflows. And speaking of photogrammetry, another application of texture synthesis is filling in missing information from photogrammetry, where often we are missing a chunk of mesh due to its inaccessibility during the scanning process. So let me show our very first version 0.0001 prototype for automatically detecting when that happens and filling in both mesh and texture data. So we start by receiving a scanned asset with, in this case, three maps. So the number can be arbitrary and also kind of made up maps here, <laughs> and a missing chunk on the bottom. We use Houdini to fill in the mesh hole and mark it with white to indicate that this part of the mesh needs texture synthesis. And the user can additionally paint other areas they would like to regenerate. Maybe there is a part of the photogrammetry ma photo <laughs> the mesh that they didn't like, like some kind of a noise or dirt. And let's say that this is a part that they would like to remove or just have a different variation. So in this case, the user marked two parts, one on top and one on the side. So this is the user marked areas. And this one is, was marked automatically because the mesh was missing there. And here's how the process looks like in action. For each marked for regeneration island, we create its own in-painted map that is unwrapped in a continuous way. And this is just to ensure that there are no seams between original and generated textures. 
And to make sure that all provide maps match, we also record a history of what texture synthesis did and apply the same transformation to all of the maps. So in this log example, we get three maps and they match perfectly between each other. So if one of them was a roughness, for example, it would still go naturally with the uh, um, color information. And now you can see the final high poly mesh with the color map applied and the synthesized parts fit seamlessly with the original texture. And this is how the original color looked like before texture synthesis was applied. And then we can just use this high poly mesh and proceed to baking it to low poly just the way we usually do. So now let's talk about some of the limitations of this approach. So first of all, it's pretty bad with complex semantics that go beyond pixel color, unless you use a semantic guide map, like in the window generation example. But otherwise, it has no understanding of what it's generating. So you might end up with pretty illogical seams, but the algorithm would insist that they totally make sense from purely local neighborhood perspective. Second limitation is that it's not that great for textures featuring a very precise ordered patterns, because then it has trouble stitching them together due to its stochastic resolution nature. Increasing neighbor count helps, but even then you will most likely end up with discontinuities in your outcome. It also cannot infer new information, so it only operates on what's already there in the example image. And in this example, as you can see, it had troubles blending that blue corner, which also manifested itself in the uncertainty map as most red is concentrated there. And if we investigate, so yeah, this is just highlighting what I have mentioned. Um, but if we investigate copied patches map, we can see how much remixing went into the left side of the image. So it can become pretty granular, which intuitively we can think of, it really had to come up with something new since it doesn't have a precise answer in the example. And that doesn't necessarily mean it will fail coming up with something plausible. And yes, it's like you see the bigger patches here because it had examples. But as soon as something it hasn't seen before and had to continue this part, it had to come up with very, very granular remixing. But a bit more illustrative example of this limitation is asking to continue a half circle on a gradient background, which it completely fails because, well, first of all, it doesn't have examples of how curvature looks like on the other side of the circle. Plus, it doesn't separate circle from the background. For the algorithm, those are inseparable concepts that exist only together because it's, that's how it saw it in the example image. And that is why in this zoomed in example image, we get dark blue because it sampled probably those, like when it started resolving, it sampled it from somewhere here, and now it had to like <laughs> blend them together, so it has no understanding. And you can also see how it manifests its uncertainty in this very noisy border. And last, this algorithm is designed for small data sets. If you have a library of 1,000 images, the likelihood that we'll use a better sample from a particular image becomes more unlikely the more images we add. In most cases, the algorithm will just go along with neighbor suggestions, thus completely eliminating using too many example images. However, it doesn't mean it will not benefit from having more examples. It just means that the likelihood of remixing a lot of images together is very small. So you're more likely to end up with something like, I don't know, three or five images used out of the total thousand you might provide in your library. So to summarize, we have talked about the vision of accessible creation and that one way to approach this is with example-based synthesis that allows anyone to describe their own generative possibility spaces. We talked about how texture synthesis works, where every pixel is programmed by our examples, and by interacting with each other, pixels emerge to look similar to, uh, to the example image. And we went through some use cases, and all of those verbs, such as guided, multi-example, single example, in painting, tiling, and how a combination of those verbs can be used for terrain workflows, geometry generation, style transfer, and photogrammetry cleanup. And then we touched on the limitations of our texture synthesis approach to highlight that it is not a silver bullet for image generation. And also for the future, I firmly believe that the next step for creative tools is the ability to generate program representations from our creative intent, sort of frameworks or meta tools that can be filled with auto-inferred rules. 
And as for our own research, our next step with example-based is moving towards 3D. We already started looking into that and looking into like things like inverse procedural modeling, where procedural rules are created from examples and even have our first baby results. But that's maybe a talk for the next year. <laughs> And if you're interested in digging deeper um, into the texture synthesis and the non-parametric texture synthesis, here is a list of references used in this presentation. And I think we probably will upload it online. Otherwise, quickly take a picture. And before we wrap up, I would like to give a shout out to the whole Embark team. This image is not very representative anymore since we welcomed so many new faces in the past months. But I just want to say that it is an absolute pleasure to work with such talented people on the topics I deeply care for. And that would be it. Thank you very much for listening. And if we still have time <laughs> for questions, thank you. <laughs>
Yes, uh, you can totally, uh, in an example, when you provide your example image, you just provide different versions of it. So, for example, you can provide them indeed flipped, you can provide them mirrored, rotated, or even in different scales, so it will actually use parts of the, uh, let's say we have a flower, but we provide uh, small flower, medium flower, big flower, then it would be able to use all of them. But you provide them at the cost of growing the amount of exam uh, example rules you have. And that is, I think, where it comes from the fact that it cannot infer or generalize this information. It has to be explicit in uh, those um, neighborhood rules. I think there's a question there as well. Yes? such as curvature of height, flip, postgrammetry and thickness, and then using it on just primarily uh, 3D models that are made in Houdini, for example, from no reference data. So the question is how we use the texture synthesis uh, to texture a mesh, of, like from scratch, with no like... R yeah, if you just use some imaginary rules and make something very abstract, for example, can you texture that by using reference textures that comes from photogrammetry? Like if, for example, you scan 10 mm. rocks, yep. uh, take their textures, and then you make something very yes. alien and then texture it with that. Yes, I think that's actually one of the very uh, interesting applications we haven't tapped into, that basically you can have smart materials, and if you provide information in terms of guide maps of that say, hey, when your curvature is this and your normal map looks like this and something else, then this is your color. And you can use it when you sculpt a new mesh, because then you're basically changing all of those parameters and it will find those example patterns from the reference library you provided. So indeed, you basically can provide, hey, I have five rocks and they look like this, I'm gonna make something new now, but the texture, yes, it should look like something like of those five rocks, yes. So that would be, I think, really awesome, but we haven't tested ourselves. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh yeah, there's a question there. Hey, uh, great talk. Uh, so you talked a bit about how this is better than Photoshop's content aware fill, but have you compared it to other things like generative adversarial networks and maybe to uh, Maximingumin's wave function collapse? Mm -hmm. um, so just a small correction, I didn't say that it was better than content aware fill, I was saying that we are also using it together. Um, but to your question of comparing it to GANs or wave function collapse. So comparing it uh, with GANs, I think one of the, why we started doing this research is because we were interested in, okay, can we do something from very small data sets, something that would not require training, because if we are interested in 3D interactive experiences, and let's say someone wants to make a vampire castle, how much data do we have on that? Or a mermaid pillow, I don't know. People would come up with probably crazy stuff. So they should be able to, it should be very intuitive the way they create those rules, and they should be able to create them just from making something. So this was one of those. With wave function collapse, I have looked at it, and it's really awesome. Um, I think one of the, it may be better for some applications, but when we're generating something very big on very um, like large image or even a, a big volume, sometimes it's better because with wave function collapse, the rules are very hard constrained, so it can uh, end up in a dead ends, and we were thinking, okay, can we avoid that, even if the generation is not going to be perfect? Because then the user will probably, oh, that looks a bit weird. I'll, like, can we get to this like 90, 80% of sweetness? And then the user may probably regenerate something. But we didn't want to just say that, oh, this is like a dead end. So hopefully it answers your question. Any more? Uh, yeah, so is everything. Is, is all of these uh, supposed to be um, offline calculations, since this is based on uh, TensorFlow, I guess? Um, this is not based on TensorFlow, but right now, yes, we are using it for uh, offline. But if you're generating a very small image, then it, it is milliseconds if you're generating something very small, like 50 by 50. Um, but as soon as you're going bigger, like I was saying, if we have 500 by 500, by 500 that is two and a half seconds. But uh, we are not using TensorFlow, and it is also not GPU accelerated at the moment. So maybe if it is, it will be even faster, but we are now just using CPU uh, multi-threading. So it's your own uh, structure on it, or I kind of missed the start. <laughs> Sorry. 
Yeah, so we are not we're not using TensorFlow. Uh, we wrote it uh, from scratch in Rust. We, well, from scratch we use uh, Rust libraries, <laughs> Rust crates, but we wrote the whole framework from uh, from scratch in Rust. Very cool. Thank you. We have one minute left, so we can I guess have uh, time for one very small question. If anyone willing to take. Okay, then I guess that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>